So now let's use exactly the same logic as I did with the one period return identity to use the, the long run identity, the present value identity, to tie together volatility, dividend growth forecasts, and, and return forecasts. There's our identity, just to, to remind you what it looks like. Uh, price dividend ratio is um, expected dividend growth and expected returns. It tells us that price dividend ratios move only if there's news about expected dividend growth or expected returns in the long run. Uh, and it tells us uh, the source of volatility has to be one of those two. Probably you can see intuitively price dividend ratios can only move if expected dividend growth moves or if expected returns move. That's just an identity. It, it, it's a fact. We can't argue about that fact. Okay, let's, let's try to put this, put some equations to it. Uh, be, just tell less words and, and, and see what it really means. Suppose we ran regressions of long-run returns or long-run dividend growth. Rows and number a little bit less than one, so a sum of log returns is, is a way of doing long-run returns. Let's form those long-run returns and run them on dividend yields. Form long-run dividend growth and run it on dividend yields, as opposed to the one-period regressions that, that we ran before. We'll tie those two together in a minute. Well, if you put those, if you ran those two regressions, Noticing our, our dividend yield identity, the identity, that identity, simply means that those two regression coefficients have to add up exactly the same way our one period regression coefficients had to add up. So that tells us long horizon return forecasts or long horizon dividend growth forecasts must add up to one. These are the right regressions really to run if you want to understand price dividend ratios, not, not one, one period regressions. Uh, but now it looks exactly like uh, the one period case. So if price dividend ratios vary at all, they must forecast. Those two things have to add up to one. They, they can't both be zero. One of them has to be big or the other or both. Our question is, which of those two is there? And, and to, to get a deeper sense of the connection to volatility, again, a regression coefficient is coefficient over variance, variance, sorry, covariance over variance, multiply through by variance, and that sum of regression coefficients says that the variance of dividend yields is the covariance of dividend yields with future dividend growth, its ability to forecast dividend growth, or covariance with future returns, its ability to forecast future returns. Those regression coefficients are a decomposition of variance. They, they add up to 100% and they tell us how much of the variance of dividend yields comes from expected return variation or corresponds to expected return variation and how much to expected uh, dividend growth variation. It, it must be one or two. So there we have it. We've linked up dividend growth forecasts, return forecasts, and volatility. We're down to one empirical question. Which of those terms is it? Well, let's go look in the data. And here's another table from, from discount rates. Uh, the direct regression line for the moment is one where I simply I, I ran exactly those regressions. Uh, I added up 15 years of subs I, I did those up to 15 years. So 15 years of subsequent returns, 15 years of subsequent dividend growth. Let's run those regressions and see uh, how the two coefficients add up. And look, um, BR is 1.01, B delta D is minus 0.011. Uh, that one's very close. The return one is very close to one. The dividend growth one is very close to zero. Uh, the variation in dividend yields is fully accounted for. There's no variation. We don't know where it comes from. It's all accounted for by the time variation in expected returns. The, the return forecasts and the volatility are exactly the same phenomenon. Uh, the volatility and the lack of dividend growth forecast is exactly the same phenomenon. There's only one phenomenon underlying everything here. Now, of course, remember, uh, on average, a high price today might be, be higher dividends or higher returns. What this is telling us is a high price on average is lower returns, uh, not every uh, single time. Now, there's one little thing left out here. Let's go back to our, uh, here's our K period uh, identity, where I only iterated k periods forwards, this raises the possibility of, of the rational bubble. Uh, if, if you hear this debate, the bubble thing comes up all along. What about the internet bubble? What about the, the, the bubble in, in houses? Well, what does bubble mean? This, at least, is one precise meaning of the word bubble, that there's a term I left out. Prices could be high, not because of expected returns, not because of expected dividend growth, but because people expect prices to keep growing in the future. That has a feeling of bubble, doesn't it? But we can test that one as well. 
This one is not just literature or philosophy. This one is a model. We can, if we only go out k periods and then run the same return identities, the, the, uh, the coefficient of returns, the coefficient of dividend yields, and the coefficient on future prices must add up to one. And, and in, in monthly data, it's almost all future prices. Prices are high today when prices will be high in a month from now. But when we look out 15 years, Notice these things, things add up exactly as they should. It's an identity. There's nothing left over unaccounted for. It's all expected returns, very little dividend growth, and, and almost nothing future prices. So the rational bubble idea, the rational bubble idea would say we see zero, zero, and one, right? Not returns, not dividend growth, not prices. It's not the rational bubble idea. The conventional view of things would say we'd see zero, one, and zero. Prices are high because people expect higher dividends. It's not that. Uh, the facts are it's all variation in expected returns. Now, why then is there this big debate about bubbles? If you watch the Nobel Prize um, in 2014, there's a big Fama-Schiller debate about bubbles and so forth. These facts really ground that debate. Now we know Schiller's volatility is the same thing as long-run return forecasts and the same thing as dividends not being forecast. They, these are, they're just algebraically the same thing. There, there's nothing different. So, uh, so what, what's there to fight about? Well, uh, you listen to Fama and he says, yeah, expected returns are varying. The risk premium varies over the business cycle. That explains it. Schiller looks at the same phenomenon and says, no, those expected returns are varying more than they should, even over the business cycle. So it's fads or psychology. The, the expected returns aren't rational expected returns. You can't just argue about this. The way you resolve this is you write down mac macroeconomic or psychological models of expected returns to see how much and when expected returns should vary over time. And, and that's what we'll do in, in a couple of weeks. You can see, though, how the empirical work and the identities really focus all of this down on, on this one fact, slow time varying expected returns, and, and, and help us a lot to, to know what it is we're arguing about. Now, there's one last very useful identity in this, uh, in this series, the return decomposition uh, due to Campbell and Ammer. Let's take our present value relationship. So that's our present value identity as before. And what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to take the innovation, the unexpected component, ET plus 1 minus ET. Well, ET plus 1 minus ET of price dividend ratio, that's 0 on the left-hand side. So what you get left over with is just the return in dividend terms. I put the current return term out to the left, leaving the current dividend term to the right, and the future ones there as well. So this gives us a decomposition of the variance of unexpected returns into the current dividend growth, future dividend growth, and future returns. You can see that's a, a ca an expected cash flow effect, big returns because we get good news about the future, big returns because, it, because a discount rate effect, we discount the future at a lower rate. What happens here? Here it turns out that the variance of, of unexpected returns is about 50% variance of contemporaneous dividends, 50% discount rates, and absolutely nothing due to uh, expected future dividend growth. Uh, now that seems inconsistent. Wait a minute. We just said that the variance of dividend yields is 100% future returns. What's this 50-50 thing? Well, what you're seeing is the effect of current dividend growth. So these two things are completely consistent, but people get confused all the time. The volatility of returns is about half that period's dividend growth and half expected, half valuation, half discount rates. The volatility of dividend yields is 100% expected future uh, returns um, because when dividends go up, prices go up at the same time. Mm -hmm.